In today's episode of the Pathmark Presents podcast, I have a very interesting guest with me here today. I'm with Hugh McFarlane, and who is the um, founder and CEO of AlignMe. And AlignMe is a B2B sales and marketing optimization, maybe team agency. I don't know how best to say it, but it's a team that's definitely going to be supporting you guys in order to you know build up growth and today we're going to be learning from Hugh and his year-long experience in the field a little bit you know on his current perspective on growth on who he is supporting and his team are supporting and ultimately his journey um, and uh, you know how he has been b2b marketing seen changing over the years so Hugh welcome to the show thanks Lucas looking forward to it Awesome. Yeah, maybe let's get right into it. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about Align Me. You know, what is it all about in your own words? We've been going for 20 years and we're fundamentally three things. Uh, we have a range of clients around the world for whom we build go-to-market plans. Um, typically, they are companies that have got a very complex selling motion. So uh, if you imagine in B2B, you can have quite simple transactions that are almost consumer-like. That's not our world. Uh, our world is where the buyer and the seller have to dance for a while. And we have a consultancy that helps those companies build their go-to-market plans. And we, uh, we provide that service in 32 countries. Uh, separately, we have a, an agency, which is a B2B agency. Uh, and we have two kinds of clients uh, that we serve there. One is uh, smaller companies, typically in Australia, uh, who've outsourced the entirety of their marketing to us. And we are uh, functionally their marketing department while they're in that funny stage of growth where you're big enough to need proper marketing, but you're not big enough to afford to build the department yet. Mm -hmm. um, also, we have... Um, Another kind of client, uh, larger companies uh, around the world for whom we are performing one or two discrete elements of the B2B marketing mix. Very cool. uh, final piece is we have um, a go-to-market planning software, which uh, we'll talk about through the show, but it's uh, initially a tool that we built for ourselves, then for 70 accredited consultants and now has some 6,000 users around the world. And uh, that are typically the best SaaS products that are emerging from actual agency use cases. So super excited to learn uh, about this a little bit more today. Maybe you could tell me uh, a little bit more about, you know, the client base that you're working with. Is that, you know, a particular vertical that you're going after? You mentioned the different sizing and segments, obviously, but is there, um, you know, do you have a particular focus or do you clients run it on, among the gamut? Um they, they're going to sound broad, but they're actually more described as in, in discrete buckets. Mm -hmm. So on the planning side, typically the company is going to be 10 million to 100 million in revenues or for very large companies, it's going to be a division that's only under $100 million in, in revenue. We, you know, if we work for IBM, we don't build a plan for the entirety of IBM. It's going to be for one geography, say, say Germany, um, and in particular one product within Germany, as an example. Um, so that's on the planning side. They tend to be between 10 and $100 million uh, in size, roughly, and for whom we're building the go-to-market plans. On the execution side we've got those funny two buckets we've got smaller australian companies typically two to 20 mil in revenue mm -hmm. and that funny band that i described before of, of growth uh, and then on the on the pure agency side where we're doing just one or two tactics rather than the entirety they can be almost any size but they tend to be larger firms you know typically 50 mil and above Super interesting. Oh, you got it very nailed down your buckets there. Um, yeah, maybe tell us a little bit uh, about the software. Like, you know, at what stage is it right now? Where can people check it out? So there's the people who are interested, um, maybe you could give us, you know, a brief overview of the software and stuff. Great. Well, thank you first for the invitation to, uh, to mention it's Funnel Planets and you can go to funnelplan.com. Um, as I mentioned, we built it initially for ourselves some 15 odd years ago. Uh, then we had a number of accredited consultants um, and it needed to be good enough for a slightly broader mix of people. Um, we've now got uh, 70 accredited consultants around the world who use it to build go-to-market plans. Uh, we also have 70, uh, if I would say, in-house consultants, companies, uh, people who work for large companies building their go-to-market plans and they also use the software. And we've got about 6,000 do-it-yourself um, uh, people who are none of those groups um, who are using the software to build their go-to-market plans. Best way to understand it is that if you're building a go-to-market plan, think of all the things you normally expect in the go-to-market plan, uh, uh, the objectives, the target market, the solution, the sales channel you're going to use, um, maybe some of the tactics. 
of course, it helps you develop, develop your answers to each of those and then communicate your answers to each of those. Um, but it also has some pretty wicked um, algorithm in, algorithms inside that help you calculate the velocity that you need to generate in your funnel for the next three years and the si size of the sales force you need to support that velocity. Super interesting. Um, talking about, you know, uh, the different journeys that people are going through in order to get started, maybe let, let's take the SMP case as an example, or maybe even the corporate case, like, how would you describe the typical journey of somebody, you know, hearing about Align Me and getting started? Like, you know, what would be the major channels that you guys are leveraging? 65% of our revenue for the last four years has come from referrals. Um, that's unlikely to change. Um, Typically, having us build a go-to-market plan is a $20,000 gig. People tend not to do that um, from strangers. And so the journey to, uh, towards uh, having us do that is typically a referred journey. Uh, we don't see that changing anytime soon on the go-to-market planning side. On the uh, outsourced marketing clients, these are the smaller companies only in Australia. Likewise, predominantly referrals, again, about 60, 65% referrals. Um, the rest of that is coming through a combination of paid search, um, remarketing, um, inbound marketing, uh, and, and a little bit of outbounding as well. So quite a wide array of channels that we're using to reach the outsourced marketing. I guess that's 35% that's not coming from referrals. Um, and uh, we, all, although on the software side, we have a significant uh, amount that's coming in through search, most of them are coming off my YouTube channel. So we've got a, um, a fairly popular YouTube channel uh, on B2B marketing, and that's our primary source on the software side. Super interesting. I mean, you really get your breakouts uh, right there. So maybe let's, um, you know, maybe for the remainder of the conversation, we sort of, you know, compare your SMB side to the, to the product because it's super interesting how you sort of think about, you know, those different perspectives. I would be curious, the websites, right? Because we talk a lot about websites and the Pathform Presents podcast, you know, AlignMe or Align.me and FinalPlan.com. Like what role do they play? Um, you mentioned um, obviously inbound uh, plays a role in, in both of them. You know, how, how do you think about those websites? So, Lucas, I, I noticed in your introduction that you made reference to the role that PathMonk plays in the buyer's journey. Um, let me make a somewhat immodest comment. I, I coined the term the buyer's journey and popularized it in my book, The Leaky Funnel, 2003. I didn't invent the buyer's journey. It's, mm -hmm. it's thousands of years old. It just didn't have a name. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing the book, I needed some way to describe uh, the collection of tactics that one might use for different stages. And there just wasn't a collective noun for that. And I found myself using two paragraphs to use what needed really two words. So I coined the term the buyer's journey. We, we think of the buyer's journey this way. Uh, immodesty is ended now. I'll, I'll go back to being um, oh, more okay. like me. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, we think of the buyer's journey as um, initially we didn't think the stage names matter. We weren't trying to sell the world on a particular language to describe the journey. But what we found is there's a couple of stages that are really quite important. Uh, if you think about the sort of more common terms that I would say are more relevant to the customer journey than the buyer's journey, like AIDA and other such simplistic models, mm -hmm. um, what they failed to do is to really get into the psyche of the buyer. So let's say I'm looking for some kind of clever tool to help me optimize my web experience and I don't know about PathMonk and mm -hmm. I'm just kind of bouncing around the net looking for ideas. At that stage, I'm doing that for a reason. Right? I, I, I've already worked out that I have a problem. I've got traffic that I'm not optimizing. And so I'm looking for some way to optimize my traffic. So think about what's in my head. I'm thinking about traffic optimization, conversion rate optimization, some such expression. That's the interest. Uh, but at some point, I have a concept about what the problem is that's wrong because I don't know as much about conversion optimization as you do. So when I'm looking, I've got a concept and your website has the job of changing me from that initial concept to maybe the concept I should have, which is, well, you think about conversion optimization, but what you don't realize is there are tracking problems and you can't, you can't optimize if you're not tracking. And so the conversation would continue. So given that frame, there are more stages in the journey, but I'm trying to simplify it for, mm -hmm. to answer your question. Given that frame, when we look at our own website and we look at the websites for our clients, different pages play different roles in that journey. Is this uh, uh, just the About Us page where people are just looking to do really two things, credentialize you and also understand your story in a snapshot? 
but they're not actually yet looking for a solution. Am I going to stay on this website at all? Whereas when they're on a uh, maybe a blog article, they might be reading about this really interesting insight that you have about a particular problem and they're reading it with interest and then kind of the light goes on and they realize actually you're right that that problem that you're talking about is present in my business. Now I'm interested in looking for a solution. So you've got a blog article that talks about a problem. That's a web page. You've then got some kind of transition that we want to get them to a solution page, but they need to segue from one to the other. And so when we think about the buyer's journey and websites and the role that they play together, it's around how do we get them from one idea, whatever idea they already have, to the next most logical idea. What's the shortest path to get to that next most logical idea without taking shortcuts? And then when they when they're on that idea, how do we get them to the next idea? And so the role that and I didn't mean to turn this into a pitch for Path Monk, but the role that your technology plays in that is important. Yeah, super. No, super, super interesting. Your perspective uh, on the journey, and um, I mean, great. I mean, our team has to definitely check out uh, the book that you mentioned. Um, very good. So I'm curious. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit more high level about marketing, because obviously you had a, a long years of perspective on how things have been changing, right? I'm curious. Like right now, if I ask you today, what would you say is the biggest challenge when it comes to bringing innovation into growth marketing? Um, glib expressions. The biggest challenge is glib expressions. People who don't market for a living saying things like the funnel is dead. What they really mean is this concept of me forcing you through a journey is dead. Well, get So if somebody visits, you visits your Perfect. website, they jump on LinkedIn, um, they're, they're engaging with other sites as well. We've lost visibility on that, but it's not that they're not going through a definable journey. You know, in the beginning, they're kind of curious. At some point, they buy into the fact they've got a problem. At some point, they're clear about what they need. Maybe I can get it from you. Maybe I can get it from somebody else. At some point, they're clear. At some point, they're really clear about what the solutions are. And at some point, they prefer one over another. That, that journey is still... Um, uh, still very strong. The, the challenge is that we've got people saying things like um, uh, the funnel is dead or they might express that the buyer's journey is, is now dead. It's not. You've just lost visibility on it. And you still need to think, where's the buyer up to? What are they ready for? And we move them to next. So for me, that's a big challenge. People using glib throwaway expressions when they don't really think through the, the, the dynamic of buying. Super, super interesting, actually. Um, maybe bring up, I'll bring up one of more of those statements, right? If we, uh, I would ask you for growth marketing or maybe even particularly for the buyer journey, right? Since we're talking very detailed about this here today, what comes to mind when I say, what is the biggest word when it, uh, the biggest challenge when it comes to return on investment? Failing to experiment. Um, people get really locked in on a particular tactic. Um, if you're working with an agency, it's normally the case that that agency is wickedly good at one or two things. And if you like the agency, you're enjoying the relationship, they're serving you well, uh, it's very tempt tempting as a marketer or as a business owner to get locked in on that tactic. And so we've got a, a, an almost baked in impediment to high return on investment because you've got this, this perception of a sunk cost I can't switch this tactic off. You can, you can switch to another tactic in a heartbeat. And so that at a, at a tactic V tactic level, um, we've got this baked in um, a barrier, which is an artificial barrier. You can change tactics quickly. Within a tactic, failing to experiment, failing to test. Um, within a test, I'm now third level and I'm going to stop at the third level. Within a within an individual test for an individual tactic, if you have the right tactic, then the, the, the third uh, biggest barrier to ROI is not understanding how, I guess, the scientific method works. You don't begin with a test, you begin with a hypothesis. Uh, right now, 40% of my users are disappearing off the website because I'm not giving them a logical next path to take. That's a hypothesis. How can I build an experiment that proves or disproves that hypothesis? So in order, I would say those three things, this artificial lock-in on, on the wrong tactic, that's a, that's a huge barrier, uh, failure to test with a tactic or failure to understand how to test. 
super great. I mean, it comes really, really comes across how structured you're actually thinking about all of these processes. <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, I'm curious because you brought up the experience. Um, what comes to mind when I say the biggest challenge uh, when it comes to conversion optimization? I'm probably going to cheat a little bit, Lucas, and somewhat use one of my previous answers. Um, I, I, I haven't a ready-made answer, but I, I think this one's going to be useful. If I'm trying to convert, to what am I trying to convert? Uh, now, I don't mean in a very simplistic sense, I want them to fill a form in. Uh, I want them to um, uh, take some other action that lets me know who they are and that they're interested in a conversation. I don't mean that. Uh, every page or every email or every ad or every LinkedIn post, they all have a job to do. And uh, I would say that, that the biggest challenge in conversion optimization is either not being clear about what that job is or having the wrong job. Um, I mentioned before that go-to-market planning is a, quite a, a, a big intervention. You know, we tend to work with these companies for eight months. It's quite a change management program over eight months. And that's something that one's not going to take on lightly. It's perhaps the reason why 65% of our revenue comes from referrals and not from colder sources. So if I tried to have a web page convert somebody who's interested in planning to have a conversation with me about such a cathartic intervention, that's courageous. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I've got the wrong intent or an unclear intent. I think that would be the biggest barrier to conversion optimization. Super, super interesting, right? Super, and I think it's what actually a lot of cases and it's, it's uh, you know, you can go through a lot of pages and you will basically see, you know, get in contact, have a conversation right now. It's like exactly what you're describing is the challenge um, in, in a lot of pages. Super interesting. Um, let's move on a little bit in the interview. One last question sort of on your perspective on marketing would be, I'm gonna make it a little bit hard, right? Um, with your um, area of um, or time of expertise, I would be curious how you would have to decide if, how would you decide if you would have to pick between, you know, for your next, um, you know, couple of months in marketing, would you be focusing on the roadmap would you be trying out growth initiatives? Would you be focusing on messaging or deep dive into your reporting, right? If you would have to choose one of those, what would you pick? <laughs> I'd choose the fifth one, audience. <clears throat> um, I, I just feel that we, we often start one step uh, too late in, in, in such a thinking cycle. We, mm -hmm. we assume the what we're going to do and we don't think about the audience so i would actually say uh, of the four i'd pick number five which is the audience uh, to whom am i going to do one of those things um uh and then i would think of path after that very good answer really really like it cool so um let's switch gears and learn about you personally a little bit you know we talked about uh, the companies we talked about the clients that you're serving the product i would be curious to learn about you personally a little bit because um you know, there is so much content out there. And by the ways of your structures, I can, of your answers, I can see you really structuredly going through content. How do you pick what type of content to consume? Like, how do you filter? Where do you read these days in order to continually educate yourself further? Um, like many people, I have switched from physical books to audio books by and large. Um, and as a part of that switch, I'm a significant podcast consumer and so i'm getting a lot of my information in formats that allow me to consume when i'm driving when i'm exercising um, when i'm in the garden um, and so to to an extent the the menu from which i can draw is limited to those who've turned their books into audiobooks and have turned their blogs into podcasts um, so that somewhat gates uh, what I can consume. Uh, I tend to read probably only one book every two months, give or take. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm listening to around about an hour of podcasts every day, so I'm I'm somewhat um, uh, shortening my attention span along with with many, um, and so I'm consuming a lot of bite-sized content. Uh, a typical podcast might be uh, might be 20, 25 minutes, uh, and so I'm I'm consuming at least two of those a day. Cool. Since we're slowly coming to an end of the interview, I would love to jump into our rapid fire questions. Are you ready for those? Let's go. Since you mentioned the books, what's the last book that you read? Never Split the Difference. That's a good one. 
What is one single thing that your company is focused on the most at the moment? Growing the, uh, the sales and marketing planning software we call Funnel Plan. Um, so growing the relevance of that for, I would say, the cognigenti. So people who already know uh, quite a lot about B2B marketing planning, uh, but they need a tool to make them more efficient. So growing our ability to serve that audience better. If there would be no boundaries in technology, what's the one thing that you would want it to have fixed for your company today? Um, the integration between CRM and most everything. Um, there are integrations, most of them are just awful. Um, many of them are lacking, I would say that. What's the last thing that kept you awake at night about the company? Um, finding and keeping the best talent. Uh, we've had a really stable period. 2020, I guess, uh, was a kind of weird year anyway, but we worked really, really hard to keep the team together and to keep them happy and engaged. Uh, and right now, that's just my biggest focus is finding and retaining the right people. Cool. And I was really looking forward to that last question um, because Align Me has been in the market for a while. I would be curious if today would be your very first day starting to work on Align Me. Right? It's the very first day you're getting started. What's the one advice? What's the one advice that you would give yourself? Read, read um, um, uh, Eric Reese's book, Lean Startup. The whole notion of um, rapid experimentation rather than trying to get it right from the beginning, I think that cost me five years. Um, I would go very fast, pivot off and Okay, cool. Here, yeah, I really appreciate that you took the time with us today in the Pathfinder Presents podcast. I want to give you the very last word, right? If somebody would be forgetting everything that we discussed about the interview today, what's the one thing that they should remember about Align Me and Final Plan? We help businesses understand the buyer's journey and how to optimize the buyer's journey. Whether that's going to be with, we're doing marketing for you, or we're doing a small piece of the marketing for you, or we're helping you plan your marketing. It's all around helping you optimize the buyer's journey. Thanks a lot for being part of Pathmark Presents today. It's been a lot of fun, Lucas. Thank you so much for taking me on the show.